Good morning, everyone. Okay, I think in the interest of time, uh, we have a lot to cover today. So since we are at the half hour, we'll go ahead and get started. So I just want to um, say hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Isabel McCann. Um, I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and I'll be the technical coordinator for the event today and I'll be running slides. So um, welcome to today's webinar, Clean Energy Transitions, Workforce Policies and Implementation Strategies to Ensure Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, um, otherwise called JEDI. This event is jointly hosted by two initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial, the Empowering People Initiative and the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Um, all of whose logos you'll see up at the top of these slides. So before we get started, um, I am going to cover just a few housekeeping items to help ensure a successful and interactive webinar. So this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online to YouTube and shared with attendees. Attendees are automatically muted upon joining and throughout the webinar to ensure there are no interruptions. However, we do want this to be an interactive event, so um, I'm going to point you to two features that you can use to interact this morning. Um, so there is a chat feature um, that you'll find in your toolbar. Please use the chat to introduce yourself or add any comments that you might have or thoughts um, about today's topics. And yes, definitely introduce yourself. We'd love to hear from everyone um, and, and hear who we have online. Um, we do have a distinct Q&A function um, for you to ask questions to our presenters. We will have a short Q&A at the end of, um, with any remaining time after the presentations. So please submit your questions through the Q&A function in your toolbar. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature to message my colleague, Holly Darrow, to, or troubleshoot, um, to troubleshoot or visit Zoom's support FAQ, which you can see the URL here. You can adjust your audio through the audio settings. If you're having any issues, you can dial in and listen by phone. Dial-in information can be found in your registration email. And then there is a, a short one-question feedback survey that will launch at the end of the webinar that we would appreciate if you would take a moment to fill out. Your response helps us tailor webinar content and improve your webinar experience. So with that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to Deborah Rowe, our moderator today, to introduce our presenters. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be here. I know this is going to be a very productive and stimulating event. So um, welcome to everyone. I welcome the participants and the speakers and the hosts. And let me give you a rundown of who you're going to be hearing from today. So I'm Deborah Rowe. I'm president of the U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. And I'm here today on behalf of the United Nations Environment Program. Um, and HESI, the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative. Uh, and then you will hear from Annette Hollis and Rob Horner, both are from the Empowering People Initiative, with Annette from Natural Resources Canada and Rob Horner from the U.S. Department of Energy. Rob is also co-lead of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Uh, you'll hear from Samah El Sayed. She is from the International Renewable Energy Agency, also known as IRENA. And then you will hear from Pablo Jacom Alvarez. He's with the European Commission and also is an Empowering People Initiative co-lead. Olu Olajide is with Student Energy. And he will be speaking today along with Raj Pandya, who is with Thriving Earth Exchange, which is part of the American Geophysical Union. We're glad to have Daniel Deng from Solar Power Europe. Each one of these people have great initiatives and resources to share with you. And uh, last but definitely not least, with a new resource to share is Olga Stryetska Ilina from the International Labor Organization. Now, after um, all of these presenters speak, we will have a robust question and answer session. So please do remember to put your questions in there. And also please remember to introduce yourself in the chat because we want to learn from each other as well from the participants. So let's start with, I'm going to hand it over to Annette Hollis and Rob Horner to give a welcome and a short explanation of the Empowering People Initiative and the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Annette is the chair of the Equality and Energy Transitions Initiative. This is a joint effort under the Clean Energy Ministerial and the International Energy Agency that works to advance the participation of women in clean energy globally. 
Um, Annette also manages a team within the Energy Systems Sectors Resources Canada, which includes management of the Global Equal by 30 campaign and the Empowering People Initiative under the Clean Energy Ministerial. Rob is the Clean Energy Ministerial Desk Officer at the U.S. Department of Energy. Rob is also a co-lead of the Empowering People Initiative under the Clean Energy Ministerial and co-lead of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. So Annette and Rob. Thank you so much, Deborah, for that warm welcome. Hello to everyone from around the globe. I'm I'm seeing all of the, the messages pour in and it's really heartening to see so many of us coming together globally to, to speak about these important issues. I'm joining you today from the national capital of Canada, known to many as Ottawa. I would like to begin first by acknowledging that the land on which I'm joining you is the traditional unceded Tory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. And I also want to acknowledge the historical and ongoing colonization that has devastated many indigenous communities. I remember the indigenous people's connection to this region, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to live and learn in this territory. Now, this traditional uh, land acknowledgement is, is very important um, to all of us in, in Canada, um, but it's ever more important when we're having discussions like today about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I'm really pleased to be here to discuss how we can build a skilled energy workforce centered around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and the important work that the Empowering People Initiative is doing to advance people-oriented transitions as part of the net zero future. We all know uh, that the transition to a clean energy future presents tremendous opportunities. And it's not only directly impacting the way we produce and consume energy, it is also resulting in major changes to employment in the energy sector. It's reshaping the workforce of tomorrow, really, and, and creating new industries, markets, supply chains, and, and jobs, millions of jobs, in fact. And these opportunities represent an important moment for action. To address the representation gaps across the global sector so that everyone, especially underrepresented groups, benefit from new job opportunities that will come about from clean energy transitions. Because in order for us to be successful, we need to put people and communities at the heart of our actions and investments. And for transitions to be truly people-centered, the diversity of the energy workforce must be central to policy and program design for workforce training and skills development. And that's really what we're working towards through the Empowering People Initiative. As uh, co-leads, and you can go to the next slide, please. As co-leads, the European Commission, the US and Canada launched the EPI at the 12th Annual Clean Energy Ministerial, um, the, so also known as SEM, in June 2021. So we're, we're still a, a relatively new initiative. The objective, as you see here, uh, of the EPI is to highlight the critical socioeconomic elements of the energy transition as it relates to advancing skills, inclusivity, and workforce development in clean energy. Through EPI, we work closely with like-minded partners like the Clean Energy Solutions Center here today. We're bringing you a, a, joint, um, a joint effort and organizations like, organizations like the International Energy Agency and, and hopefully others, uh, uh, some of the others that are on the call. So really we're all working together to advance people-centered transition as part of a, a net zero future. And that was the intention uh, from the get-go of, of launching this initiative, really not to be working as a siloed initiative, but really to be um, to be reaching out and, and working with partners to advance these issues. There are so many working in this space and together, you know, we can really be a force um, to, to bring these, these issues to the fore. Um, next slide. We only have two slides today, so, so nothing too complicated, but just to, to give an example, recently at the 13th Annual Clean Energy Ministerial in, in September, which was hosted uh, by our US colleagues, the EPI and the International Energy Agency released a joint report, uh, which includes a selection of case studies on existing skills and training programs across several countries. I, I really uh, urge everyone to, to take a look at this report. Um, it's an excellent snapshot globally of the, the different kinds of, of case studies, the different kinds of best practices in skills development and training uh, programs and, and policies. Uh, the report findings support governments and organizations to take actions that ensure all workers can benefit from new job opportunities in the clean energy transition. 
Really, as I mentioned, our intention with this report is to share best practices and lessons learned to guide our efforts as we work towards a common evidence-driven, people-centered approach. And you know, as we look forward to the future, we're looking for, for other partnerships that, that really work in this space. This morning, we'll get to, or this afternoon or this evening for, for many, uh, we will get to listen to experts describe opportunities, challenges, and solutions to prepare the workforce for just and inclusive clean energy transitions. And I'm really looking forward to it. My hope is that the session will allow us to build connections and share successful precedents so that we can work together towards our shared goals for a future workforce. I'll end off here. And it is now my pleasure to give the floor to my good colleague, Rob Horner in the uh, Department of Energy uh, in the US to uh, introduce the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Thank you everyone and over to you, Rob. Thanks, Annette. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining. I've been looking at the chat. We have wonderful participation from around the world. It's really exciting to see everyone here. Next slide, please. I'm joining you as co-lead of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which is co-hosting today's webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center, like the Empowering People Initiative, is an initiative under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The purpose of the Clean Energy Solutions Center is to broadly accelerate the transition of clean energy markets and technologies, and specifically to, to assist developing nations um, with that goal. We're co-led um, by the nation of Australia, along with the United States uh, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, here in Golden, Colorado uh, is our operating agent. We've got over 40 partners working with us um, to deliver services free of charge uh, to users to help them accelerate uh, clean energy transitions in their countries. Uh, working on uh, specific issues that they're facing in their context. Our website is is here on the slide. Uh, it doesn't uh, commit itself to memory very easily, but you can always go to the Clean Energy Ministerial website, cleanenergyministerial.org, and take a look at all of the initiatives there. You can find the Clean Energy Solutions Center website as a subpage there. Next slide, please. The Clean Energy Solutions Center um, uh, assists developing nations with uh, clean energy transitions through three uh, main tools. One is the Ask an Expert service. This is available on our website. Uh, any uh, any uh, um, government actor or someone who is, is acting on behalf uh, uh, of a nation's uh, energy space can ask a question of our expert service. Um, we will take it in. Our experts at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory will uh, decide amongst our network of 50 experts from over 15 countries to help answer that question. Um, and we'll provide a, you know, a useful answer to that free of charge. We also have training capacity building primarily through webinars like the one that you're listening to today. Um, we also have a resource library that um, has been up for a while and, and we're updating with, with new resources every day. They're there on the website for you to use to assist with your clean energy transitions. Um, that's all I'll say on the Clean Energy Solutions Center. We're really proud to be uh, co-hosting the webinar today and look forward to um, what our, all of our panelists have to say. So with that, I'll hand it back over to our Master of Ceremonies, Deborah. Thank you so much, Annette and Rob. That gave us a good overview of our co-hosts and the wonderful initiatives that you're running and the resources. So please, everybody, do dig into those and use them. Um, so next up is actually myself on behalf of the United Nations Environment Program and HESI, the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative, which is um, HESI is a collaboration of multiple United Nations agencies and a bunch of higher ed networks for sustainability and the clean energy transition all over the world. So I'm going to talk to you for the next few minutes about our green jobs initiatives, creating the workforce readiness that we need for the transition to a green and sustainable economy. Um, this, the Education and Actions for Green Jobs initiatives has many collaborators. You can see on the left there, the logos of just some of them. They've all done essential work to make this, these initiatives happen. But also we put together a global guidance document 
and you can see that in the chat. Um, links are going to keep coming in the chat as I'm talking. The global guidance document was put together because we found it was difficult to access all of the great resources on education for green jobs. And so we put together a framework and 81 resources all in one place. You can see just some of the contributors there, like UNEP, UNESCO, UNIDO, UNITAR, et cetera. Um, next slide. So we all know that the clean energy companies are very busy trying to stabilize the climate, trying to reduce the worst impacts from climate change by accelerating the implementation of clean energy. And so they don't really have time to do all the training and all of the um, glitchy kinds of job placement processes that might exist with nonprofits and universities and uh, technical colleges. So we put together a solution. This Green Jobs Initiative is designed to help the employers meet their workforce needs more effectively. And what are our outcomes? So first we're focusing on the clean energy area, but we're also um, expanding to the broader green economy. And what we are improving through this initiative is the curricula and the skills of the employees. We're also improving the career advising and the career guidance. We're also improving recruitment into the field and the job placement process. We should be rolling out the red carpet for these clean energy companies. And we're also getting researchers around the world through our SDG Publishers Compact Fellows Program. Um, we're working with publishers to get more useful research, to align that research to the climate situation and to the other sustainable development goals. So those are the outcomes of the initiatives. Our progress so far is in five key areas. We've created an international virtual community of over 4,000 members. Who are these members? They consist of the following higher education leaders like chancellors, presidents, rectors, but also the educators themselves and those who sit on curricular decision-making bodies. It also consists of career advising associations and their members getting into their hands better information on the wonderful jobs that are available and the career pathways. It also includes employers from multiple sectors, business, government, nonprofits, and in order to get to those employers, we've been working with the trade associations and their members. It also includes policymakers, right? We're building a whole system here, a system of change so that we can accelerate the solutions that already exist to help uh, with climate change and uh, with adaptation and mitigation. So policymakers are key in there. Uh, we are also including the ministerial offices and their staff, the ones who are going to be there and be able to put forward the new policies and change the cultural norms in their countries. And we're working across ministerial offices because that collaboration is necessary. And then finally, student organizations, always key to hold us accountable and to tell us more about what they want and need. Next. So we've held two introductory convenings so far. Uh, the first one was with the International Association of Universities. We talked to educators all over the world. And then secondly, we had a convening with REN21 for the clean energy employers and their trade associations. After that, we held solution summits. So we now hold solution summits. The first solution summit was on sharing challenges and possible solutions regarding these key outcome areas of recruitment, career advising, employee, pl employee placement, but also retaining those employees once you have them. And also uh, curricula is coming up next. Our second solution summit is being held in partnership with this SDG Publishers Compact Fellows. If you have not seen this website yet, I strongly recommend that you do. It's got tips for researchers, for practitioners. We're working with publishers to update textbooks so that what the students are learning is up to date and what the research is focusing on is useful and gets out to the practitioners and the policymakers. 
We've convened journal editors and publishers to create more relevant research. As I've said, get results out to practitioners and align educational materials with these issues. Next. So our next solution summits, these are multiple summits that we have planned. Uh, one is specifically for technical and community colleges, uh, one for K-12, another one for funders, uh, because we don't want the tail to wag the dog, so to speak. We want to align what the funders are doing with what's actually needed out there. Uh, another one for practitioners and researchers. We actually have one just for researchers coming up that's not on this list. And another one for employers and educators and job placement staff so that the job placement process and the retention is better. And then another one for career advisors and recruiters, and then multiple ones coming up, we hope, for policymakers. Next. So um, just so you know, UNEP, uh, being so pleased with the work that's been done so far, has now expanded this into a bigger Green Jobs for Youth Pact with UNICEF and ILO um, on how to make the transition. Uh, globally to a low carbon circular and nature positive economy. And they are focusing on these areas of employment, entrepreneurship, education, and empowerment and youth partnerships. Uh, we also happen to run a Youth for Climate Education International Youth Coalition on this. Other current uh, projects and collaborations you'll hear today from um, Raj at Thriving Earth Exchange. Uh, Thriving Earth Exchange is working with ICLE Global. We've also brought in Epic N. What is this? This is 2,500 mayors in the Global South. And our goal is to increase city level climate mitigation and adaptation in some of the poorest communities of the world, thousands of them, connecting experts and students to communities. Next. Uh, we also work with Power for All, which is a focus on India and Africa on their workforce needs, particularly in distributed renewable energies for uh, remote locations. Next. Uh, of course, we're working with the Clean Energy Ministerial. That's why I'm here today, uh, both on their policy library and uh, policy making collaborations. Next. And I've already mentioned the International Youth Coalition that we run. Next. And then we also were given a, an international platform so you all can talk to each other. I strongly recommend you check this out. It's got knowledge items. It's got ways to do networking. It was given to us by four UN agencies to the youth and the youth turned around and gave it to the Green Jobs Initiative. Wonderful. Next. And we also work with Irina. You'll hear from them today. Next and also ILO. We love their new tool for TVETs and you'll hear from them today. We've invited them to speak. So congratulations on everything you have already done, but even more so congratulations on what you'll do in the future. And there's my contact info if you want it. Thank you very much. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my dear colleague, Sama Al-Sayed. Um, she has uh, wonderful information to share with you about a new initiative um, called the Energy Transition Education Network. Um, Sama is a program officer at IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. She leads activities related to renewable energy education and skilling, including this Energy Transition Education Network. It's a new multi-stakeholder partnership. Sama? Thank you very much, Deborah, and it's always a pleasure to be on a panel or an event with you. Um, and I'm really pleased to join you all today for this discussion with what I think is a very interesting set of panelists. I'm very excited to hear what everyone has to say. And it, it's really great seeing that education and workforce training is being centered when we talk about ensuring justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We all know that adequate training and skilling opportunities are a really key first step in building a representative workforce that draws on the talents of people from all kinds of backgrounds. And so today I'm gonna to share a little bit with you on a new multi-stakeholder partnership that we launched last month at COP called the Energy Transition Education Network and this brings together institutions that are working at the forefront of energy and education. Next slide, please. All right, so before I get into the details of the network, I really just want to 
to take a step back and share with you some facts and figures from Irina's work on jobs and employment in the energy sector. So just to give a, a bit of context to what it is we're talking about. And of course, one of the things that is clear is that the energy transition will completely transform the economy. We're going to see many new jobs being created, but also a greening of the skills that are required within existing occupations. As of last year, 12.7 million people were employed in the renewable energy sector. And Irina's analysis shows that a 1.5 degree compliant pathway could create as many as 122 million energy sector jobs by 2050. And this includes 43 million renewable energy jobs, as well as many other jobs in areas such as power grids, energy flexibility and energy efficiency. And this, of course, means we really need to rapidly build the human resource capacity um, that's required for achieving energy transition goals. And so we need to identify and address some of the skilling gaps that are out there. But at the same time, we're seeing that many groups that are underrepresented, so both within the renewable energy workforce and energy decision making more broadly. Um, and this includes women who represent only 32% of the renewable energy workforce as a whole, and only 28% of STEM professionals. Um, and in some sectors, for example, wind, the representation of women is even lower. So it's at about 21%. Um, so it's clear that there's still a long way to go to making sure that women and other groups are well represented. And so while there are many factors contributing to this, um, including cultural and social norms, workplace environments, we need targeted education and training efforts to promote the inclusion of underrepresented groups. And so we can't go around relying on gender blinds or in the case of some countries, race line strategies to addressing underrepresentation, we really need targeted efforts. Next slide. All right, so back to the network. Um, so last month at COP, IRENA and partners launched the Energy Transition Education Network. So this is a new global multi-stakeholder partnership that brings together leading stakeholders that are working at the forefront of energy and sustainability education. And the network is open to organizations, to educational institutions, to teaching networks, to professional bodies, community-based organizations, really anyone who's engaged in energy education. And it's also, of course, open to governments, including both energy and education ministries. And the network has three broad pillars, so three broad areas that we're focusing on. Um, in line with the Education for Sustainable Development agenda, the first pillar focuses um, on energy education for promoting societal transformation. So we want to ensure that all people have the knowledge and information they need. We want them to be empowered to demand and contribute to a sustainable energy future. And so this includes both a focus on formal and non-formal education efforts. The second pillar um, focuses more on educating the energy transition workforce and, and building the skills and human resource capacities that are needed for the energy transition. And the third pillar, the third pillar is a little bit different and it focuses more on scaling up the use of renewable energy within educational institutions. Next slide, please. So the, the network has a particular focus on what we're calling educating the educators. So building the capacity of educators, of teachers, of lecturers, trainers, by giving them the tools and resources they need to empower and skill their students. And so some of the key activities that we're focusing on include developing and also sharing curriculum and teaching resources. Um, and in fact, this effort has already started. We had a workshop with partners this summer um, we've been engaging with them on the development of a set of teaching and curriculum resources for use in primary and secondary schools. Um, we'll be releasing these resources um, early next year. And we'll also be pilot testing them with the Ministry of Education of the United Arab Emirates. Um, after this, we'll also be making them publicly available so that teachers and education ministries around the world can adapt them to their own national context. We're also currently forming working groups to develop open source curriculum modules for higher education. 
Now, in addition to this focus on curriculum and teaching resources, some of the other activities of the network will include promoting exchanges of best practices in renewable energy education, engaging in joint capacity building activities, contributing to analytical activities that look at skills gaps and priorities. We'll also be working to make policy recommendations and I mean UNESCO will be publishing a report soon looking at this and we'll be engaging in high level awareness raising on the need for enhanced education for the energy transition and of course the aim is not to duplicate existing activities but to enhance and build on ongoing efforts of members and address gaps where they exist. Next slide please. So here you just see some of our, our founding partners um, and we have a range of different kinds of partners, everything from international organizations to teaching associations, to governments, and um, to professional associations as well. Um, next slide. And we really welcome expressions of interest to join the network and membership is open to any actors that are actively engaged in the space. And the level of engagement can vary depending on how involved you would want to be. So you could be actively engaged in contributing to working groups around selected topics. Um, if you have existing resources or curricula, you can contribute these to the repository we're developing. You can share tools and good practices, participate in knowledge exchange opportunities and events as well. And so if you'd like to make, learn more, please do feel free to contact me at education at irena.org. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I'll be pleased to answer any questions later on. That was just wonderful. Thank you. I'm really excited about your work, as you know, and look forward to being part of those working groups for the uh, higher ed curricula um, and uh, really doing some of the convenings around uh, curricula and building those uh, learning communities. So next, we have Pablo Jacome Alvarez. Pablo is a socioeconomic analyst at the European Commission at the Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs, and Inclusion. He works for the Fair, Green, and Digital Transition Research Unit following the energy-related files. And he's here to tell us about the green skills initiatives at the European Commission. Pablo? Thank you very much, Debra, for your introduction. It's great to have you here and to have your energy in this webinar, so always great to have you. Uh, first of all, I have to excuse uh, Frank Sieber Thomas, my head of unit, because he was supposed to uh, to be here and he wanted, of course, but uh, he's busy today with some political negotiations that were, uh, at the time, it was a bit out of our control, but uh, as you know, he follows very well the, the development of our uh, initiative. So I will be delivering the, the presentation on his behalf. Uh, I would also like to thank the Clean Energy Solution Centers to, for organizing this event. As Annette and Rob said this morning, uh, well, this, at the beginning, uh, we firmly believe that it's only by bringing together various actors and entities that we will manage to deliver a fair green transition in all sectors, but especially in the energy one. Uh, and I would also like to extend my gratitude to the colleagues of the Empowering People Initiative, Canada and the United States, so all colleagues, uh, which our initiative, so the Empowering People Initiative, uh, is working very hard on many fronts, as uh, uh, Debra knows very well, uh, um, related somehow to the topics that we are discussing today. And this webinar is actually, yeah, indeed the perfect opportunity to mutually learn and improve our understanding of how today's workforce will be fit for the future. So we look forward to keep our cooperation within the API to involve all the partners that are present today uh, to the extent possible. So on the next slide, you will see that I will start with a very brief background uh, of the policy context from our perspective, from the European Commission perspective. And on the next slide, I will start, of course, I have to start <laughs> with the Green Deal, uh, which is the raised climate ambition uh, by becoming the first climate neutral continent by 2050, uh, which is an objective that was legally binding uh, uh, thanks to the European climate law and is supported by an unprecedented set of uh, policy measures. Uh, and of course, uh, we need obviously green skills to deliver on this commitment. And on the, on the next slide, you will see that this uh, ambition uh, in response to the unprovoked and unjustified military aggression against Ukraine by Russia, uh, we had to uh, further accelerate this transition 
that's why we presented the Repower EU initiative, uh, which ultimately seeks to drastically reduce our dependence from Russian fossil fuels and take advantage, so to say, of the opportunity to further accelerate the transition, as I said, uh, within this concept of context, sorry, of course, supporting our workforce uh, with the right and necessary skills uh, is even more important than, than before. This being said, and the background being set, uh, in the next uh, slide, I will start uh, uh, drafting a bit of uh, the initiatives that we have on green skills. And first, in the next slide, you will see that we can differentiate between three groups, more or less. Uh, first of all, will be the technical skills, uh, which in this context will be unique, maybe uh, specific to the energy sector, but not only. Then we will have these transversal skills that we always uh, talk about, uh, which will be supporting the green transition in a cross-sectoral dimension and can be shared. And then, at last but not least, the citizenship skills, which are oriented to the society as a whole and are often underrated a bit, uh, but they are equally capital to succeed in the transition. Uh, we, we cannot have a transition if the citizenship is not uh, behind. In the next slide, I present also very quickly, uh, uh, next slide, please, thank you. The, yeah, a milestone, a very important milestone that we had, which was the taxonomy of skills for the green transition. And I invite you to check the link in the presentation that you will receive afterwards and navigate through the 571 skills that were label, labeled, sorry, as green. Uh, this ultimately should support our stakeholders uh, to better understand which skills are needed to further accelerate the green transition. Another uh, major element on the next skill, uh, oh, sorry, on the, on the next slide, is uh, the recovery and resilience facility with more than 1.5 billion euros on funding, which is dedicated to green skills and jobs from reskilling and upskilling to uh, the very much needed educational policies and instruments uh, that we have to put in place. In the next uh, slide, I will like to also present a bit the European Year of Skills, very important milestone as well, uh, which is, of course, next year, 2023. And um, with the European uh, Year of Skills, in cooperation with the European Parliament, member states, social partners, and all relevant stakeholders, uh, we propose to give a fresh impetus to lifelong learning by promoting investment in upskilling and reskilling, making sure that the future skills are relevant to the fair green transition and we are investing in them, matching people's aspirations with available opportunities in the job market. So otherwise we wouldn't have the citizenship, uh, the citizenship behind uh, the transition, as I said before. Also something very important is to attract people uh, from third countries uh, with the right skill sets. And uh, this is especially more important as I see uh, all the nationalities that are popping in the chat uh, from the, uh, the attendance. So very important for us as well. And last but not, but not least, developing the skills, intelligence tools and mapping instruments at all levels, local, regional and national, international, but also firm level to understand which skills are there, which skills are neither and how, uh, needed and how to, to deliver on them. And um, yes, let me, before ending the presentation, let me just mention that uh, in the last COP27, we had the first Just Transition Pavilion, uh, which will be repeated next year and it's confirmed already. And uh, it yeah, probably will focus a lot on skills, given that the, it is the European Year of Skills 2023. And I have to mention as well, before finishing, uh, the Pact for Skills, uh, which is a shared engagement for skills development in Europe. And I'm really happy to see Mr. Dang from uh, Solar Power EU in this event, as they recently joined the EU Solar Skills Partnership. And last, of course, I also the gender dimension of skills is really important. I don't have time to get into it right now, but we share the uh, importance of that topic as well. And hopefully we can discuss it even more during the Q&A. So with that, I will be more than happy to reply to your question during the Q&A and thank you for your attention. Pablo, thank you so much. So much important information that you shared. And uh, we really appreciate all of your efforts coming out of the European Commission. Um, next, we have Olu Olajide. Olu is a senior associate and manages the Student Energy Career Training Program. Prior to joining Student Energy, Olu worked as a business development engineer at an oil and gas service firm in Nigeria. 
Then he worked as an independent consultant interviewing energy experts for the EDIPEC Energy Dialogues and the Titans of Nuclear podcast. Olu? I know we were having some trouble with connections with Olu. And we cannot hear you if you're trying to speak with us. So we're going to skip over Olu's presentation while he tries to reconnect, which means we move on to Raj Panja. Rajul Panja is the Vice President of Community Science at AGU. Can you see me smiling involuntarily? Yes, that's because I enjoy working with him and his organization so much. They have an incredible vision and an implementation um, that he will be telling you about to build a more uh, sustainable future for us all. Uh, AGU is an international organization to advance earth and space science. And community science is the equitable collaboration of science with communities to advance the community and the societal priorities. Raj is also the founder of AGU's Thriving Earth Exchange Program. Over to you, Raj. Thank you so much, Deborah, and, and good day, everyone. It is an honor and a, a privilege to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about community science, where science is really used to advance community priorities and how AGU's Thriving Earth Exchange tries to advance community science in part to advance goals around just clean energy transitions, but also to provide hands-on learning opportunities for community leaders, for scientists, and for students so that they can practice some of the skills necessary for the green energy transition, especially the citizenship, collaborative, and translational skills that, that Pablo mentioned. And the goal of Thriving Earth Exchange in, in a way is to really transform the culture of science so that science becomes more responsive and a better partner and ally, especially to communities that have historically been marginalized, colonized, or otherwise oppressed. Um, before I begin, though, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking in from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Boulder is land that was taken from the Ute Arapaho and Cheyenne Indians. Colorado is home to 48 contemporary Indian tribes. And it's part of the United States, a country that has a legacy of enslaving people. And I share that acknowledgement um, to remind myself in my work um, and in my life to try to use science and the tools of science to advance justice and repair past harms. Um, with that, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, community science is science done in partnership with communities. It's communities and scientists co-creating together in every step of all of the processes of science, from defining the question to be investigated to applying the results to making a difference. There's three big fundamental principles of community science. The first is it begins with community priorities. It's never about scientists telling communities what they should do. It's about scientists being allies for helping communities accomplish the things they want to do. The second is it ends in community impact. Scientific papers are wonderful things. They add value to the world, but they are not a community impact. A community impact is something different on the ground in the places people live, work, play, and pray. And the third and probably most important for this conversation, science is a human right. Every community deserves the right to ask and answer their scientific questions. The community outside the refinery deserves as much opportunity to investigate air quality as the people inside the refinery. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thriving Earth Exchange works by reaching out to community leaders. Community leaders sign up for free, and then they're matched with a fellow. Fellow is trained by the Thriving Earth Exchange team to learn good practices for collaboration, for active listening, for social engagement. And together, they design with the community leader a project, a project that advances community priorities, a project that uses scientific skills and scientific resources. They recruit good and relevant scientists to work on those projects. AGU has a network of about 150,000 Earth scientists, and we're privileged to work with a lot of partners to extend that network even beyond the Earth scientists. And the projects are then managed to outcome in about two years. Uh, next slide, please. 
we've done uh we've we've been lucky to work with a lot of projects over the years we've done about 243 projects um 375 scientists 500 over 550 community leaders um those fellows i talked about 140 of those many of them early career folks who are interested in learning the skills to take their scientific and technical training and make it more community relevant we've worked in 11 countries and 42 u.s states and i want to share as i end if we could go to the next slide please um, some results from some of our projects that have focused specifically on clean energy transitions. Uh, we did a project in Tionic, Alaska. We supported a project there to design renewable energy um, to reduce the reliance on diesel, imported diesel, diesel that actually had to be um, boated in every year. Um, we did a project in Arlington, Virginia, to look at policy changes that could support the creation of community-based solar. Um, and how we could reuse or how the community could reuse uh, right of ways on roadsides to produce solar, especially for uh, members of the community who had like, less economic wealth. Um, and then in Fresno, California, there was a pretty in-depth analysis of the opportunity for renewable energy. And I want to share some conclusions from that project because I think that con those conclusions are really helpful in understanding this uh, landscape of community engagement around clean energy and just transitions. And um, one of the things that project uh, discovered was that some of the community members um, didn't have a lot of opportunity to become familiar with energy topics and that those topics actually felt a little removed from their daily lives. Um, asking those residents to invest time and energy um, in energy conversations in energy transitions if done poorly, could actually add a disproportionate benefit for those residents. Um, they're already dealing with challenged physical environments, with pollution, with heavy workloads, with a legacy of injustice. And so we needed to be sensitive um, to how to ask them to do this additional collaborative work of building a just energy transition. And one of the ways we did that was to expand the conversation so that just energy transition was included in some of the larger um, overarching and more immediate issues that people were, were thinking about. And the last lesson from this project, I think, is in some ways the most important, that it can be tempting to think that um, this hierarchy of needs, the immediacy and urgency of some needs, means that residents don't care about the longer term environment or don't care, or it can become an excuse to neglect that. And it's really important um, to, to, not, um, to not adopt that mindset, to respect that residents, regardless of, of their physical and environmental conditions, have awareness and a right to think about the long term future. And it's our job as people with technical expertise to engage people in supportive conversations around that while also recognizing and supporting everyday needs that people have to engage in those conversations. And with that, I'll stop and say thank you very much and look forward to the question and answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm speechless. I love your work. Thank you. Um, Daniel Dang is our next speaker. Uh, Daniel holds the position of the Director of Business Development at Solar Power Europe. He and his colleagues have co-created a platform that will help people who want to get education um, in energy know where to get it, and also for those who want to look for jobs to be matched with the companies who are looking for employees. And this is not just for Europe, but it's international. This is a very exciting platform they put together, and he oversees the business development strategy of the organization. He's also an external brand ambassador of Solar Power Europe, and he's in charge of establishing and maintaining a consistent corporate image throughout all the business development activities of the association. Another human being with vision and action. Daniel? Thank you, Deborah, for this uh, very kind introduction. And, uh, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, excellent, uh, excellent webinar. Um, solar Power Europe is the European Solar Association, and, uh, and uh, we represent over 280 organizations active along the entire solar value chain. That includes companies, research organizations, uh, national associations, and so on. And our job is really to create a bridge between the industry, the solar industry, the solar sector, and the policymakers from the European institutions. 
And I'm very happy to share with you today some of the work that we have done uh, to, to help solve actually one of the biggest challenges that we see for our sector, but also for the renewable energy sector uh, in general, which is the, the lack of enough people with the right skills that can actually help us accelerate uh, the energy transition. If we go on to the next slide, we estimate that by 2050, uh, solar can create around 4 million jobs, and that's just in Europe. If we go globally, this number probably triples. Uh, we thought that the first step to attract the right people to our sector and, and to get them excited about solar was to, to create an awareness campaign. Uh, we, we partnered with Google.org, which is the philanthropic uh, body of, of the company Google that you all know very well, to, to create a number of videos uh, as part of this communication campaign to, uh, to, to raise awareness of the different kinds of jobs that you can have in solar, the different skills that you need to work in solar, but most importantly, to show how exciting and, and how important it is uh, uh, to be part of, uh, of this industry, because essentially you are helping solve one of the, the most important challenges of our generation. We targeted initially some key markets uh, that we're very much active in, where we see solar as a, as, a, as a driver for the energy transition that included, but was not limited to France, the Netherlands, Spain, um, Poland, and Germany. If we go to the next slide, although we were very happy with the results of the awareness campaign, we thought that we need to do a lot more and we need to, uh, to take some practical steps, first of all, to, uh, to solve the, the skills gap, but at the same time to, to accelerate the, um, the awareness of the different kinds of, uh, of jobs that are available in solar and make the bridge between job seekers, those who might be interested or do not know much about solar, and the companies that have a range of jobs available. We, we put a very, very ambitious target for ourselves uh, to create the first online solar job fair in just 11 months. Uh, actually, in the beginning of 2022, uh, we, we, we wanted to create uh, an online event where, uh, where we could allow companies, first of all, to share uh, why soul is important, but also to talk about diversity, to talk about inclusion. Maybe for a second, I'll go back to one of the, the slides from, from our previous presenters, Irina, where actually uh, the number of women in, in solar is by far the highest when it comes to women employed in uh, in the renewable energy sector. We're very, very proud of, of this fact, but at the same time, we know that we can do a lot more. And that's exactly what we addressed also at the Solar Works Fair. We wanted to talk about how um, women, how a, a diverse group of people can actually help a lot with the innovative processes in, in solar, and, and particularly when it comes to, uh, to technological uh, development, to technological innovation. The Solar Works Fair uh, connected over 500 participants, and we're very, very proud to have more than 50% of those as job seekers. Uh, this was also an opportunity to, to shed some light on the exact skills that are needed in solar, but also to bust a few myths that you don't need to be an en only an engineer to be in solar. And I will allow myself to, to cite uh, one of the co companies that joined the Solar Works Fair, uh, it's an inverter company, and for those of you who um, are not uh, are not so much uh, into the the technology of solar, the inverter is in fact actually the brain of uh, of the solar system. And and I was very very happy to hear from one of the speakers there saying that actually even the companies that are manufacturing the brains of the system are not only looking for brain surgeons. Uh, the solar sector and the renewable, se re renewable energy sector in general is looking for people with a broad range of skills. Uh, technical, yes, that is definitely something very useful, but also uh, skills in business development, skills in finance, skills in, in accounting, and so on. So really a wide range of skills that will be helpful. At the same time, we're talking about a transition of skills. We want to have a just transition to renewables. We want to accelerate this. But we also understand that there are a lot of people who are working in, in the conventional energy sector. There are a lot of people from other sectors that uh, might, 
might want an extra help to ensure that we actually attract them to, to our sector so that we can accelerate the transition together. Now, the solar job fair was also an opportunity to join our solar, uh, to, to launch our solar works platform. And if we go on, on the next one, slide, I will explain a little bit further what it is about. The platform is, uh, is, is an online website that allows, first of all, job seekers to create profiles from solar skills list that we develop together with many of the companies uh, in solar that we work with. At the same time, uh, we provide the opportunity for solar companies to create job openings using exact same skills list. Then an algorithm is matching the, the profiles of the job seekers with the job openings that the solar companies uh, uh, have posted and, and essentially is, uh, is putting forward the best matches for, for solar workers, but also at the same time, the best matches for the solar companies. And if there's a, a gap in the skills, it really highlights the kind of trainings that those people can take so that they can, uh, they can have better chance in, uh, in, their, um, in their search for, for various kinds of, of jobs. Now, we, we've just launched, launched this platform on the 1st of December. And for us, this is just the beginning. We know that there's a very long way from here and we're very happy to, to work with various partners uh, around the globe, but this is a, a global platform. Yes, our home is in Europe. Yes, we want to support local jobs development, but at the same time, we know that this is a global effort and climate change is a global problem. That is why we invite uh, companies from all over the world, but also job seekers from all over the world uh, to go on the platform. I will share more details about it in the chat. And if you have any questions, please free to, to contact me directly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for what you are creating for all of us. Um, so next, I wanna go to the International Labor Organization uh, and to Olga Strietska Ilina. Olga is an area lead for the Skills Strategies for Future Labor Markets at the ILO in Geneva. Her work, her stunning work, focuses on anticipating skills needs for the future of work, skills for trade and economic diversification, and skills for environmental sustainability and climate action, as well as skills for technological change and digitalization. I've listened to her many times. I always learn. We're so glad to be collaborating with her moving forward. Olga, over to you. Thank you very much, Debra. Thank you for the kind words. And the pleasure is actually all mine to collaborate with you. And also let me start from thanking the organizers to give the ILO award on this important subject. So just to start, since we're discussing justice and equity, uh, inclusion, then for the ILO, the framework we deal with is a framework which is called Just Transition. Um, next slide, please. So the Just Transition framework, which was adopted in 2015, actually deals with whole comprehensiveness of policies. And why is it important? It's important because the transition to um, a green economy, including uh, climate-proof economy and renewable energy, uh, even though we estimate that the overall the employment impact will be positive, the transition might be quite disruptive and doesn't mean that people are not going to lose jobs. It also doesn't mean that automatically everybody will get access to jobs. Without policy action, this may not happen. And many people and eventually societies and economies may be affected negatively. So that's why the ILO, together with our constituents, and as you may know, the ILO is a tripartite organization, so our constituents are not only governments, but also the private sector, employers, as well as workers, came up with this comprehensive net, uh, framework of just transition towards environmentally sustainable and economic and societies for all, where a list of policies that have to be complemented hand in hand with the climate policy and environmental policy, such as employment policy, macroeconomic, fiscal, job creation, enterprise policy, social protection, 
active labor market policies, including counseling and guidance and skills development. So skills development is actually one of the main pillars of the just transition. Why is this? Can we go to the next, next slide, please? So this is the results of our 2019 projection. Of course, it's an, it's an estimate, it's a, it's a global projection. Uh, in one scenario, there were several scenarios produced. This one actually deals with the energy transition since we're talking about energy. So this is the transition from the fossil fuel energy generation to the renewable energy generation. And the estimate is produced by 2030 for the report from 2019. So perhaps, you know, if we have to produce the update and we hope to do that next year, probably we can go a little bit upward in terms of number of jobs estimated to be created by 2030, which is in this case around 25 million, um, is one scenario, one policy transition, renewable energy. But you can also see that in red, there are some numbers of jobs that may be lost, 7 million. The good news is that most of these people would be able to relocate to new jobs within the same country, the same occupation, in the growing industries, that is a result of the transition policy implementation. However, there are some people who may need major retraining into new jobs to know, know that everybody can benefit from uh, the green jobs transition and also that the social and individual costs of that transition are minimized. You see on the right hand side, the estimate actually by gender and I think one of previous speakers mentioned how important gender is. And this is exactly what is happening, that males will be mostly benefiting from the job creations, not from not females. And why is it so? Because the, as any projection, this is basically a repeated trend of the past into the future. And the trend is like that. Females are really, women are underrepresented in, in uh, energy jobs and renewable energy jobs included. And we know that the most efficient way of getting women to jobs is actually through granting them access to training. So that's why it's very important. And another important element in the next slide, when we ran that projection by the level of skills, this is what we found out that most of jobs will be generated not at the higher education level, not universities, quite some, yes, but the most of them at the middle skill level. So these are plumbers, electricians, technicians, uh, laborers in manufacturing um, and construction. All these people will need some retraining, reskilling, upskilling, and this is all the level of technical vocational education and training, T-VET. Can we go to the next slide, please? And of course, you know, when we speak about formal qualifications, this is one part of the story, technical skills. Another part of the story are also soft skills, such as teamwork, communication, problem solving, creativity. These are all are also very, very important for the transition. But uh, for the TVET altogether, to deal with the challenge of uh, reskilling and upskilling, uh, current workforce and also preparing the future workforce so that they can benefit from this green jobs creation. Uh, we, of course, uh, through a number of years, through the green jobs program, we have been working with countries uh, on implementing their skills development projects in uh, TVET, Technical Vocation Education Training. And based on all that experiences, we are now um, basically uh, summarizing the experiences and also translating the, that experiences into new programs such as Climate Action for Jobs. This is the UN-wide program coordinated by, by the ILO. And the ILO uh, UN, again, Global Accelerator for Jobs and Social Protection, as well as our own ILO program on um, uh, skills development and lifelong learning. So this tool, which is based on all the experiences and projects we implemented, is a practical guidance tool. Why is it practical? Because it gives the learning points, it gives not only theory, but also some practical self-assessment approaches. Many uh, examples, practical examples coming from all over the world, hints and tips, some checklists and 
useful resources. And it provides uh, the user with the opportunity to go through the whole circle, the whole process from identifying what occupations, what competencies will be prioritized for the green transition. And then working on the competency standards on related curricula and training, teacher training, uh, greening the whole learning process, including uh, green approaches in campuses, um, synthesizing enterprises, because very often enterprises who are supposed also to deliver the places for apprenticeship training, they are not aware enough of the benefits and potential gains they can have from the implementation of the, of the green practices, even cost-saving measures from energy saving and water saving techniques and so on. We we'll also look a little bit at what can be done in the situation of the informal economy. So all these aspects in a holistic manner give an opportunity to the user to implement that. Either the whole TVET sector, uh, dealing basically with the greening TVET reform, or maybe just elements of that if there is no funding or there is no need to implement the whole holistic reform strategy. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, so far we have been implementing in a number of countries. Um, in Ghana, we worked uh, with sectoral skills councils, sectoral skills bodies, and helped them to implement the greening strategy through industries they are working in. In Zimbabwe, we worked on uh, teachers training and also developed, helped to develop action plans to uh, vocational education training centers. In Zambia, we work together with the regional training center, which deals with the whole Southern, um, Southern Africa region in renewable energy, actually, uh, helping them to uh, uh, develop assessment of greening priorities for, that, for their sector. In some countries, we accompany this tool with a coaching program. This was the case for Cambodia, Thailand, and the Philippines, where the experts, international experts and the ILO coach the national counterparts, usually those responsible for the design and the system of vocational education training, helping them to green specific selected competency standards and curricula and implement that, working really side by side with these people. So the, the beauty of the tool that this is actually quite flexible, it is very much learning oriented, it's a learning tool, action oriented as well, it's flexible, it could be developed, implemented with or without coaching, but also we treat this as a process oriented because of course, you know, reforming education or implementing elements of greening education or training is not a uh, a story which can be done once and forever, it has to be updated all the time. So it's rather a journey rather than a destination. Um, in a way, it's also a systematic, holistic and normative tool because we would like to make sure that all the elements are then mainstreamed into the system and legislation uh, and also inclusive because this is applicable across the board to different, very different occupations and very different target groups as well. So I think I will finish on that. If we can go to the next slide, this is basically gives you a, an overview of uh, a wealth of the ILO publications on the subject. I would encourage you to go and to see them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, just wonderful, your work. And uh, hoping to get many, many more countries uh, to take advantage of the uh, the precedents, the successful precedents and the tools that you have and the mentoring. Um, so I want to go back to Olu now. Olu's joined us um, so that he can talk about student energy and the great work that they're doing. Um, and then we will still do the question and answer. So we may run over a few minutes past the 45 minute mark just to let you know. There's also some answered questions already in the Q&A and you can click on the answered tab to see those. So Olu, over to you. And Olu, we did try to unmute you. Um, let us know if uh, hopefully you can, we can hear you. I don't know if you're trying to speak. 
And we need his slides up as well. Yes, I'll navigate to those. Olo, keep trying. Okay, but looks we... like I figured it out. Yeah, there we go. Yes, looks like All I right. figured it out. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes we, we can, can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so apologies, everyone. Uh, the organizers and I have been having a little side adventure to figure out how I can speak. So excited to finally get the chance. So as I've already been introduced, I am a senior associate at Student Energy. I am the program manager of our career training um, uh, initiative. Um, so I can speak a bit about that. So first about Student Energy, um, we are the largest youth-led organization and really our mission is to empower the next generation of energy leaders. Um, we have uh, over a network of over 50,000 youth from 120 countries, and we have a lot of really great programs that empower you directly and um, give them access or give them more access to opportunities in the energy sector. But I'm going to specifically talk about the career training program, which is one of the more recent initiatives, and uh, it's the initiative that actually joined energy to help develop. Um, so career training is a four-month cohort-based program. Um, that launched at the beginning of this year. So we just, uh, we're just running off our second cohort. Um, so we have the, the objective of the program is to help young people get into clean energy jobs, whether that is uh, internships or entry level roles. And that was really the idea behind the, uh, behind the program. So uh, I'm going in blank. I think we should be about uh, career training right now. Um, so the program is structured into two parts. Um, so the first month of the program is dedicated to a general curriculum. So we can go to the next slide here. It talks about the curriculum. So the curriculum covers um, a lot of really important things that um, the cohort needs to know going into the program. Um, so out of the four months, the reason that we take the first month to talk to go through a curriculum that focuses on energy systems on one, uh, project management and uh, model thinking is because the core of the program is to enable um, the, uh, the core that comes in to be able to do a real world energy project. So we want them to have that tangible work experience on their CVs. So when they leave the program, they're going out with um, very actionable experience that they can use to leverage into different outcomes. The outcomes that the, uh, the co-op members usually look for is one of three things. So it's either to get an internship um, while they're still students, um, to apply for graduate programs um, that are focused on energy or sustainability, and also to transition their careers. Um, so those are young professionals who want to transition their careers um, from whatever it is into the clean energy sector. So because of that, we have people coming into the program from different points in their careers. So any systems on one is really like a big equalizer. It kind of like gets them uh, a very uh, much more of a crash course into what energy systems are and uh, how they can start interfacing with it. And I think that's such a good introduction because it levels everybody out and it kind of prepares them for the kind of work they'll be doing uh, in the later half. Uh, project management is very important because the teams will be working in teams of five. Um, so each each uh, each court member is put into a team to work with a project partner, and I'll get into that in a bit later. And then what we're thinking, because we're going to be working on sometimes very technical projects that have to do with us, and getting them used to uh, interpreting data and showing it off and putting it in actionable reports is a big part of the program as well. We also have a specialized curriculum that focuses on um, two things. So the one that we've done is uh, model thinking. Uh, it's the energy and market, uh, energy policy and market analysis, which kind of like does what it says. And the second one that we're introducing in the third cohort, development and finance. Um, so the core of the program is really projects. Uh, so we can move to the next slide that shows off our project partners. Um, so for the next three months in the curriculum program, the cohort are going to work with um, some of the wonderful partners that are, are working with us um, on this initiative. Uh, the partners for three months. So the partner organization comes in with a challenge or a problem that the organization has, and we recruit a team of uh, a team of five court members to work directly with the organization to put together the final deliverables and wrap it up with a final report, whatever format that takes, and also a final presentation for the project contact and also some key stakeholders that um, have to do with the project in the, the project partner organization as well. So we've been very privileged to work with some really fantastic organizations. Um, we've worked with Etsy for All, NL Foundation, Power for All. Uh, we have a few more that are not listed here. We've worked with AP, which is a consultancy based out of San Francisco. We've also worked with Canyon Energy, which is a developer that turns waste to power. Uh, they're based out of Calgary, but they also have some operations in the US as well. 
Uh, but really, the core of the program is to expose them to really core um, energy projects, and um, that has been fantastic. So in the first cohort, we had 25 participants from uh, 16 countries. In the more recent cohort, we've had six participants from 17 countries. So we have a very diverse group, and it was really excited to see how they come in because we have such a competitive uh, admissions process. So when we get them in in the first um, orientation webinar, and as the teams right now are wrapping up their their projects, it's so good to see the growth that they've had. Um, so I just want to like highlight a few um, success stories from the cohort. Um, I think we are running out of time a bit, so I'll just stick with two. Um, so the first one is a personal favorite: is a young um, Nigerian petroleum engineering student who is in his final year. So he joined the program, and in his application, he said that he wanted to transition out of oil and gas and move into clean energy. And uh, after the program, he was able to join ONG Energy Access as part of the mini redevelopment team. And uh, that was just like a huge win because we, we focus a lot on outcomes in the program. And another one that I like to highlight is somebody who's more experienced. So it was named Devin, and he was a design engineer at, uh, at a construction firm. And he wanted, he's been trying for a long time to transition to clean energy. And after the program, he was able to join a uh, solar PV app developer in, uh, in, in Canada. So... You've had you've had so many unique experiences, and it kind of shows that we can put action to a lot of what the um, the other panelists have said um, throughout the session. We can put action. We can actually put uh, young people in front of opportunities, and we can find organizations that believe in our vision. And then when we match them up, we can see a real impact come out of um, come out of the work we do. Um, so I know that there are a lot of students and young professionals on this course. If you're interested, um, we are launching the, the new cohort of the program early next year. Um, so applications will be opening up very soon. Uh, please, on social media platforms to stay updated. And for the organizations, if you are interested in this program and you'd like to partner with us as well, I'm very happy to kind of like take this conversation. And uh, you can email me. Uh, I hope the organizers can put my email and uh, contact information in the chat as well. And I look forward to uh, exploring more. And thank you all for this opportunity to speak. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, great to get this information and hope many on this call would be interested in being part of this next new cohort. Um, so we want to move on now to questions and answers. We know we're running over time, but those of you on the panel who can stay with us, if you could please uh, turn on your cameras. We have four active questions. Um, we have four that have already been answered. So all of you participating, you can click on the answered tab to see those. But let's move on to the ones that haven't been answered yet. So Fidel says, unexplored fossil fuels, of course, gas, oil, and coal deposits have been encountered in most African countries. And some corporations and companies are still conducting mineral exploration and prospecting. From the conversation at COP27, well, you can see this, right? So I'll just summarize it. The main, while well, the main focus was on renewable energies and the just transition, what is your view? concerning this issue, basing your argument on national growth and a way or a pathway to renewable energies. So who would like to answer that for us from the panel? I can certainly start if you want, Debra. But I please, please invite all the panelists to also chip in, of course. But uh, yeah, super relevant. It was very close to another question that uh, I answered uh, already, but indeed super relevant how to involve the African continent. And I see so many participants, I'm very happy to with it. Uh, it's very complex to give a, a full reply here, of course. But I would invite first to check on the Repower EU a website that I put into the other answer. I will copy paste the link again in this question, because there there is this international energy strategy that, that was put forward by DG Energy. And uh, there we have some points, of course, on all the African cooperation. And overall, my main reply to this question would be that we work on fair transition. It also applies internationally. It doesn't look only at European countries from the European perspective. It looks at the whole of society internationally at large. And Africa is a super important partner, of course, or all African countries and uh, citizens of the European Union. So. For sure, when we mean fair, is fair for everyone, uh, including Africa. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we all acknowledge that there is a tension there and that we have to keep our eyes on it, right? And we have to make sure that the solutions occur. Um, so 
I want to move on to unless somebody wants to say something else. I noticed that Sama put a um, yeah. a link to a report. Yeah, go ahead, Sama. Sure. So I mean, just to flag, I also added a link in the chat to an African market report that Irina released earlier this year with the African Development Bank. And I think one of the, the important points to focus on is that the energy transition alone brings so many benefits for the African continent. Um, and of course, we need the policies, we need the investments to make this happen. And I think a key component of this is also industrialization policies. So making sure that um, Africa is able to develop the supply chains, the value chains that it needs um, to have manufacturing on the continent, to have you know, a true African energy transition. Um, and of course, an important part of this is also the skilling and making sure that we are making use of the talent pool, the skills pool that exists on the African continent. There are many talented people there. We don't need to import expertise. Um, but of course, this means that skilling needs to be a, a key component of a transition within Africa. So I just wanted to add this. Yeah, thank you. May I also add something that, yeah, I completely agree with uh, Sama here. And in, indeed, as I said in my presentation, the European Year of Skills is also looking to attract third countries uh, workers. So in the end, if we invest in reskilling and upskilling opportunities in Africa, it will also impact our workforce beneficially for both ends. Some African students, for example, will benefit from a, a, an opportunity there to improve their skills. They will come to an European country to uh, work with us and then come back to their original country to keep working in the uh, energy transition there. So I only see win-win uh, situations <laughs> in this. Thank you. Uh, so Vanessa's got some great questions here that I want to get to. The first is, as we transition into green energy, I believe we have to acknowledge that will not happen overnight, but over a long time. This involves creation of new industries, which are capital intensive. How do we convince governments to actually channel funds to it, even after the multiple conferences we've had, like the COP27? And the implication there is we are not getting the level of finance and investment that we need. Who would like to address that? So while they're thinking about who wants to address it, we are working with ICLE Global and really researching all the different ways that we can accelerate financing. It is urgent and we need to keep calling for it, but to do more than call for it, we actually need to get it done. Yeah. I don't want to be only me to participate. So I really encourage other colleagues here. Yeah, one quick thought that I have in here. Yeah. Planning is very important for governments, uh, for all gover governmental institutions uh, to put the funding into place. Uh, but all the planning always means administrative burden. So it's very difficult to find a good balance between the two. Uh, otherwise, governments simply do not have the skills even or the uh, uh, capability to uh, implement those uh, fundings. And we, sat, we see that in the European uh, level many times. So that would be a first idea that we put in the table that we try to keep the administrative burden to the bare minimum uh, that is possible. So actually governments can work on implementing the fundings that are there. Uh, and also, yeah, funding mapping is... Uh, uh, that topic that we are always uh, lagging behind. Sometimes the opportunities are there. It's just that we didn't manage to communicate them in the in the right uh, way. But Olga, I see your you have your hand raised. Go ahead, Olga. Yes, thank you. Um, I think you know I'm I'm not really environmentalist. I'm I'm a labor economist. Uh, but as with any investment. Uh, the market is not something what decides for everything, right? So the, of course the context ex itself is changing. And I think with the current context, everybody recognizes the importance of the transition to alternative energy resources, simply diversifying them, especially with the, with the Russian uh, invasion into Ukraine and you know, basically in the energy crisis we're all going through now. Um, However, um, I also would like to underline the importance of investment policy and industrial policies, and basically attracting investments into renewable energy sources is one of industrial policies. 
So if you create the environment that makes um, it interesting to invest in renewable energy with subsidies, with tax breaks and other possible measures, this, of course, the investments will increase. Um, the one of, some of the European countries that are now considered champions in renewable energy, for example, in Spain, they were also going exactly through the same process some 20, 10 years ago. Um, and starting basically from point zero or almost point zero to uh, at some point overproducing uh, solar and wind energy. And this was done with the help of industrial policies implemented either at national level or regional level, which is also possible. So that's my take on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now that we're also looking at innovative ways to go past just looking for national government commitments, um, the cities really need help with the financing as well, uh, even the, the nonprofits and, of course, the startups. So organizations like the Alliance for Rural Electrification, uh, there's a group GET, G-E-T, and, and you can come on to these conferences and you can actually meet with investors. So there's some you know, um, matching that's going on, so look out for those. Um, but also we're looking for the equivalent of Akiva.org that would work for cities. So if anybody on this call is interested in working with us on that, please reach out to us about it. We all need to continue to work on this very quickly because it, it won't accelerate at the pace we need to prevent the worst impacts of climate change unless we really go after that. And Vanessa's got another great um, question. Did anybody else want to speak to that one before I go on? Yeah, is this about the gender equality um, related to? Yeah, so let me just next. speak to that question and then you can Sounds go good. first on that. So she says, men may benefit more from the creation of green energy jobs. As much as we would like to create the TVET opportunities for women, we need to encourage women to go into these technical jobs. In many traditional African setups, the girls are discouraged from pursuing the sciences and engineering as technical-based activities because of social constructs. How do we demystify these jobs for girls and women, welcome them into this? How do we undo these social constructs? Great question. Go ahead, Annette. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... It is a great question, and I'll put on my hat working on kind of the the, the where I work on on gender equality initiatives. One of which is Equal by Thirty, which brings together uh, governments and and private sector to advance the participation of women globally. I think you're raising an important point, Vanessa. That you know a, a lot of times our emphasis um, is you know at the career stage, maybe maybe in in kind of college and university, but you know once. Um, you know, uh, people, women have entered the workforce. Um, you know, we look at addressing um, EDI um, and and looking to to increase their participation. But I I think it it does start a lot earlier than than that. Um, and certainly, I I don't want to speak um, for for Africa. Um, I, I'm not uh, African, but I will say that many of the solutions I think are, um, you know, African women are, are at the heart of some of these solutions in, in raising awareness and, and having these conversations, but it, it's not just them. Uh, it, it takes everyone. I, I think it takes um, partnerships with with um, educational institutions. Uh, there, are, there are lots of global examples around the world um, that, you know, that work with, with schools, uh, school-aged children, um, with girls to encourage them to uh, to get into the the STEM field and and to pursue uh, studies in, in in that area, I, I have two girls myself, um, so I, I understand the critical important importance of the of the social norms that start um, even in Canada at very early age um, in discouraging girls from from these careers. So I think it takes partnerships there. I think it also um, you know takes uh, partnerships with grassroots organizations there there are many many uh, excellent ones uh, one that comes to mind um, is Energia it's an international network um, on gender and, and sustainable energy um, they have a strong uh, base in, in in Africa headed up by a wonderful woman named Sheila Aprasha um, doing great work there but it, it does take collaboration at, at all levels and and really thinking about these things uh very early on um and as we as we know if we're going to get um to you know to address our climate goals to to really to power the the clean energy transitions we will need all hands on deck 
and it, uh, um, you know, if you if you look at kind of towards 2030, 2050, of course, you have to be starting um, with with young, young children and women and girls. So uh, I'll leave it there um, because I see that that some of my colleagues um, uh, have their hands up and, and, and perhaps want to address this question as well. Thank you. And we only have a minute or two left. So Sama, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to echo what Annette was saying and the, the need to start early. Um, I read this, one of these interesting reports recently on a draw a scientist study. And so even today, when young girls are asked to draw a scientist, overwhelmingly they draw a man. And so we need to start early to, to change these perceptions of what a scientist, what an engineer looks like, but also what these people do within the energy transition, because it's not just the traditional ways that we might view engineers you know we're also contributing to social change which is something that as women we, we tend to care quite deeply about and I, I think emphasizing this is important um, and so this is one of the things we're doing with the curriculum resources that we're developing for schools is showcasing energy not just within stem subjects but within social sciences within arts within design across different subject areas and for different age groups um, and so I, I just wanted to, to take a moment and highlight this as well. Great. Uh, you know, I, I may be the only person on this uh, meeting today. I've been up on roofs. I've installed solar. I owned a retail and wholesale solar company and energy management firm. And so it's about getting our stories out about how you can do this and also dealing with those cultures where we don't feel so welcome. So we have women's organizations where we can speak and support each other as we bust through these old stereotypes and social constructs, which really do need to be addressed, right? If we're gonna have thriving communities and a climate unstable world in the coming future. So thank you for the question, Olga. I know you've got something to say too. Now, just to add, I think everything has been said already, but also to say that there are quite efficient uh, women's synthesization programs that actually deal exactly with uh, encouraging women to participate in training and taking up those jobs, showing all the benefits, not only for, for females themselves, but the whole household, because usually this is the case if women are involved into training and the get a job, the, more, the whole household benefits from that. And also the importance of the cash transfer programs, which are linked to uh, conditional, so training um, of women granting access uh, to training and then conditioning the cash transfers to households upon that. That worked actually quite well in, in Brazil and some other countries. And uh, to mention the experience with Gramin Shakti in uh, Bangladesh and India, would provide a training for women and young people in um, solar panel, panel installation and also improved uh, stoves that created many, many jobs. And uh, also uh, not only in, in, the, in the panel installation, but also in the production of the spare parts. So if you think sort of in, in the whole value chain and creating jobs and sustaining them over the future and training women and young people for that, that, that would work actually also in Africa. So I guess I also, respond a little bit to the next question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Pablo's giving an answer to the last question there. So I think we are set for today. I, I really want to thank our co-hosts. Thank you so much, Rob and Annette, and also uh, the National Renewable Energy Labs and Ralph for everything that you did to make this happen. And of course, to all of the speakers, um, wonderful, wonderful work that you've shared. And we look forward to doing a very productive, um, successful precedents and more sharing and supporting each other and collaborations in the future. So thank you, everybody, for your time. I also want to thank the participators because the participants today, you are the one who will, the ones who will take this information and make it work going forward. So congratulations, participants. We want to hear what you do. And um, please do save the chat. Um, and we will be sending you the slides and the recording. And for today, we are complete. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everyone. everyone. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. It's been so a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.